A British charitable club says it's to close following allegations that hostesses were groped at its men-only annual dinner, according to a report in the Financial Times. The rich and the powerful donated an astonishing £2 million in a matter of hours. But working that night was an undercover reporter who claimed some of the women hostesses were groped at the all-men event. I was groped several times, and I know that there are numerous other hostesses who said the same thing had happened to them. Back in 2018, we had the FT exposing their dinner called the, the President's Club, where they had two undercover reporters join as hostesses to this all-male black tie event where the waitresses were groped, propositioned, um, and it billed itself as the most un-PC event. And this was where some of the titans of British industry were going and thought it was OK until it was exposed by the press. Yeah, and thanks to that press reporting, really, it's been forcing businesses across the world, particularly in the UK, to confront the long-standing laddish culture and mistreatment of women. But what's crazy is that during those years and through all those reports, the CBI was very quick to speak out against sexual harassment. That's right. Karen Fairburn, who was the leader of the CBI at the time, um, was leading the condemnation of that culture. And now what we've learned is that within the CBI itself, there were cases of sexual harassment and most seriously of all now, two allegations of rape. And this scandal has led to an exodus of members from the CBI and it's calling into question the very existence of, the, of this lobbying body, which remember, used to be so vital and such a kind of an important convening uh, place for British business. The prime minister would show up every year at its conference and they had a huge sway over the direction of British businesses and now it's really fighting for its survival. I'm David Merritt. And I'm Francine Lacqua. And this is In The City, Bloomberg's podcast connecting you to the conversations at the heart of the City of London. This week, we'll reflect on the culture within British businesses in light of the scandal unfolding at the CBI, the Confederation of British Industry. We have spoken over the last few months on this podcast about the problem of the culture in the city and, and, and business as a whole. But this CBI scandal really shows that the problem runs very, very deep indeed. With us, Bloomberg UK business reporter, Sabah Meddings, who authored a piece this week looking at how the potential fall of the CBI, which is a UK political titan, could serve as a warning to all businesses. So Sabah, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Sabah, give us a bit of the, the, the history here to set the scene. How important was the CBI to British business and, and how significant would it be if it disappeared? I mean, I was at the um, annual conference in November. We had Rishi Sunak there on the first day. And remember, that was just a few weeks after the disastrous mini budget. So Rishi was really on a mission to win back business. Well, Tony, let me start by saying thank you to you and your team. The CBI is a valued institution in this country and a powerful voice for business. He walked onto the stage introduced by now the former Director General, Tony Danker, and address business. And the very next day we had Keir Starmer on his charm offensive. Good morning. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, conference. It's a real privilege to be here in Birmingham to address you at such a pivotal moment for our country. Um, so that was that was as recent as November. If you look back over the history of the CBI, during the pandemic, they would have been influential in securing the furlough scheme. Um, you know, they've been real campaigners on childcare issues. Um, they sort of had been their favour in government has kind of waxed and waned over time. They really fell out of favour during Brexit um, because they ended up being on the wrong side of the of the debate. But over time, you know, I spoke to um, Vince Cable a few weeks ago and kind of was asking him, you know, when you were business secretary, how much influence did the CBI have? And he identified three or four policy areas where they had really thrashed out a solution and. Come, whether it was um, women on boards, Vince Cable wanted a quota, they wanted more of a sort of a voluntary sign up and there, there countless other issues, pay, he wanted a kind of a, um, a much stricter pay policy, they campaign on behalf of business. So really the CBI has had a quite a vital um, kind of position, you know, era of government of the day throughout its history. And what's shocking of course is the allegations is that they're extremely serious and in the past, they had spoken out against sexual harassment. And, you know, provided training. You know, people would look to the CBI to set the example, get advice on HR issues, advice on kind of supporting women in, in the business. And, yeah, you know, I spoke to 
um, Anne Frank, Chief Executive of the Chartered Management Institute. Um, and she said, you know, this is the organisation that was promoting corporate leadership. And the fact was they didn't know what was going on in their own organisation. So it's kind of this perceived hypocrisy that has really riled a lot of businesses up. You know, their members have been fleeing as a result. Nobody wants to be associated now with the CBI. What happens for British business if the CBI doesn't exist? As you, you, you listed some of these policy changes and their ability to influence government and the idea of business clubbing together and speaking as one voice, representing themselves to, to government. What happens if that disappears? I think when well, you've got the British Chambers of Commerce have been really quick to say, look, we can be a voice for business. Should everyone have a land has kind of, you know, they uh, will be alongside the CBI in lots of um, issues, whether it's kind of furlough scheme during COVID. So there are there are individual lobby groups. But, um, you know, Jeremy Hunt even said, you know, he said quite recently, there's no point engaging with the CBI and their own members have deserted them. But they do say they want to speak speak to a body that sort of speaks on behalf of business. So there are a lot of questions like how, you know, what happens now? And I guess it's pretty unknown at the moment. But police are now investigating two alleged rape accusations. Does this go to, you know, in, internal culture problems that it wasn't also, you know, alerted to sooner? Or like, how can this even happen? So it might be worth just kind of going back and um, telling the story about how this, you know, we got to this point. It started a few weeks ago. The Guardian newspaper published a story to say that Tony Danker, the former director general, had been accused of workplace misconduct. It listed several um, allegations, but um, the CBI said that Tony Danker would step aside. He apologised for causing any sort of distress to any employees and they hired a law firm to investigate. At that point, we then saw a few weeks later, The Guardian reported another story and this is when the allegations became very serious. They spoke to a dozen women, uh, past and present employees at CBI who um, kind of highlighted a kind of a litany of complaints about sort of harassment from senior managers, including a boat party in 2019 on the River Thames when one um, woman claims that she was raped. Then the police invest start to investigate. At that point, we kind of got businesses starting to speak out and kind of being really critical, saying, you know, what is going on at the CBI? We need them to investigate to find out what's gone on. And then it was just a couple of weeks ago, a second woman came to the Guardian newspaper and alleged that she had been raped in an overseas office by two um, colleagues. It was at that point that the kind of floodgates opened and a lot of businesses said enough is enough. We had Amanda Blanca, Aviva was the first uh, CEO to make a decision, but it was this Friday when, you know, our inbox was flooded with statements from businesses saying, you know, we are either cutting ties, we're pausing engagement, we can't have anything to do with the CBI. And... Um, Tony Danker is, has now been sacked for his for his part. He's you know he said he feels he's been made the full guy. None of that was anything to do with me, and it was all before my time. First thing that's happened is my reputation has been totally destroyed. I've been around the block, and I know the way the world works, but it's so clear I've been made the full guy. Not that they just throw me under the bus; they reversed the bus back over me. And there is a new um, by direct director general, Ray Newton Smith, who was the former chief economist, who's come in to lead the organisation. But there's been a lot of, um, you know, a big apology from the CBI. They, we must do better. We'll be a leaner organisation. But it's very much um, uh, big question marks. It's interesting, isn't it? That it was a female chief executive who was the first person to come out and say we're not going to be associated. You made Amanda Blanc from Aviva. I mean, does that not? symbolise a little bit part of the problem here, the, the imbalance in British business and the reaction to this scandal as well. I do think it is significant that it was a woman that came out first and said, you know, enough's enough because the CBI, you know, it's only ever had one, well now two, but only ever had one female director general, one female president. And I think it's sort of whether even Ray Newton Smith said that, you know, it's a very hierarchical organisation, you know, very much in the establishment. Um, almost all of the prior director generals and presidents are now lords or dames or sirs. Um, so it's sort of, it is kind of, it's a relic of a bygone era. And, you know, do we need more questions now about, you know, what do women in the workplace want? What makes them feel protected? Different processes. I mean, a real criticism of the, of the CBI, and they admitted it, was that um, you know HR didn't report directly to the board. 
you know, there was these these complaints were being made to managers, but people were sort of saying, you know, I am, um, I think, you know, you think about your career in, in that, you know, do you really want to cause any trouble? And it wouldn't, it didn't get up to, to board level, so they say. So it kind of, um, I don't know if that's a funny way of saying, I don't know whether it's sort of a female issue or just a modernisation issue. Because why has it taken years this to come out, right? This boat party you mentioned, where this first allegation has been made, it's 2019, right? So how are the systems in the CBI so broken that no, that complaint has taken years to surface? Well, this woman said that she did complain to her manager afterwards and was told, get some counselling rather than report this to the police. So it's only, I, I, it's really hard to know kind of the, um, the stress and the trauma that must have happened at that time. But to kind of go to your manager and then be told that, you know, maybe you need to get some counselling over this issue rather than actually report it. I mean, where's the zero tolerance um, attitude to that? And, and, and the CBI said also, you know, in, the, in this long letter that the president, Brian McBride, wrote, he said, you know, he admitted the organisation failed to stop people being hired and they didn't fire them when their bad behaviour came to light. You know, they would seek a resolution, um, you know, perhaps an apology. I mean, that's not zero tolerance. The, the criticism is that people were sort of felt they could get away with it. Sebastian, if this is a problem of process and a problem of culture that could be running quite deep, how do they reset? That's a really good question. And I think um, a lot of concern and, and um, mistrust about whether that can actually happen. I spoke to Rain Newton-Smith, who's sort of come back and they, Fox Williams has come up with a sort of really long list of recommendations of kind of how they should improve. That's a law firm? That's the law firm, yeah. That's the law firm they hire to investigate. But I mean, it's their job now to prove to members that they, they can and they've got a meeting in June um, where they're going to sort of put the new CBI, whether it's still called that, they might rename it, um, to members to kind of ask ask for their support and coming back. But if you know if they don't win them over, I mean the CBI makes twenty five million pounds a year. Twenty two million of that comes from membership fees. So it's it's not just about sort of claiming to speak for business. It's actually sort of having the financial um, ability to continue. So they've they've got to they've got to get business back on side. And I mean businesses I've been speaking to, then they're, they're not convinced. I was going to say, you know, when your conversations with with businesses, is it going to be enough just to change the name? And to say we're going to do things differently, or is the whole organisation so poisonous now as a, you know that no one will ever want to be associated with it again? Well, that's the thing, isn't it? Is that the court of public opinion is very powerful, and if you're a if you're a chief executive, if you're a, of any gender, you know, are you what? How do you tell your employees that you've kind of signed back up to the CBI if you're not absolutely convinced that it's a new organisation and that you know, the problems have been um, resolved, that they're even speaking to government at this current time. The CBI doesn't have the ear of government. They've, they've stopped engagement. So, I mean... So what's the point, right? If you're not, if you don't have a seat at the table with government, that's the whole purpose, isn't it? So, I mean, that is a, the, a, you know, that's the number one, probably sort of uh, goal the CBI needs to sort at the moment, is it can it get Jeremy Hunt, Rishi Sunak back on side and let them open the door again? Because it, as you say, at the moment, the CBI isn't doing all that much. But it's also, is it questionable, and actually Ray Newton-Smith, who's former chief economist at the CBI, now in charge of the CBI, not accused of any wrongdoing, not, you know, as far as we're aware, had any knowledge of anything that was going on. But the fact that it's a former CBI in charge of reforming it, how problematic is that? Privately, businesses are quite concerned about that. Um, I don't know whether some have said this publicly as well, but definitely privately. And it's not so much about whether someone... Um, how was anything to do with it or had any knowledge of it. But it's, you know, if you're the uh, leader of an organisation, how could you not know? I mean, isn't your responsibility to make sure that your whistleblowing processes are really strong, that your HR department is, you know, completely independent, people know there's a place to go if there's any problems and that you will fix it. So, I mean, I spoke to Karim Bilimoria. He was former president. He's still on the board. And he said um, he had absolutely no inkling of any problems. He's absolutely shocked by the reports. Um but I mean, you know, if, if you're in charge of these organisations, someone needs to be kind of trying to root out these problems. And, you know, they're all shocked. We all, we're all shocked. I mean, it's, it's absolutely horrendous. But, um, you know, does it need a new voice to come in and actually kind of clean it up? I don't know. I mean, Ray Newton-Smith, she wants, she's determined to get the organisation back on track and, and fix the problem. But it definitely is. It's been a, something that members are thinking about. I mean, for one of the companies, if it was a FTSE 100 company, where this had happened, you'd expect the board probably, wouldn't you, to say we need to bring in maybe an outside uh, figure to clean up the mess, right? Like like tapping an insider feels possibly the wrong strategy if you're going to really start start afresh, right? 
Certainly, and I want you know, would shareholders tolerate that? It's um, you know, so I don't members. I mean, they they say the members are really pleased with the appointment, but yeah, I mean, it's something. It's a real serious question that I mean, I don't have an answer to it, but um, it's yeah, people are definitely asking. Do you think this issue is content? I mean, is it a one-off with the CBI? We we spoke at the beginning about you know the big scandal around the President's Club, which had a lot of chief executives from FTSE hundred companies there who thought it was okay. In your reporting on British business over the years. Do you see this problem as far more wide reaching, that there is a cultural problem in Britain uh, with our biggest corporations that are still stuck, perhaps in some of the ways of behavior of the last century? It's hard to tell, isn't it? I mean, I know for sort of the drinking culture, it may not be that lunchtime is such a boozy event as it once was, but you know, it certainly it certainly still is in some quarters. In in you know, lunch is still you know, it might not you just be. Just have to walk around around here on yeah. a, on a Thursday lunchtime, right? People yeah. are people They're are definitely at the pubs. Pints. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I definitely think kind of post work drinks. I mean, this is obviously um sort of a more general comment on culture, but you know, rather than the most serious allegations, but kind of post work drinks. You know, Thursday night is a kind of in London. It's the new Friday. Everyone's you know, outside our office, they're, they're piled yeah, up the streets outside are heaving, the pubs. Right? On a Thursday night, it's <laughs> Certainly amazing. as the weather gets warmer. So I, I don't know whether um, that's something that happens in other countries, but um, it's definitely a big part of the city still, I would, I would say. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, you know, you, you have scandals in a lot of other countries like France and Italy, and I don't know whether it's tied to the laddish drinking culture or whether it's just sexual harassment in the workplace that could happen even within a boardroom. I mean, un- unless you take a zero tolerance approach, then you could probably argue that it happens in, in many countries. CBI only employs 300 people. I mean, and it's quite a small it's team, much right? of a problem with that many people. It's hard to say that it, it doesn't happen elsewhere. I think one of the like key criticisms of the CBI is that there were a lot of um, managers that might have been promoted without any training. So it's kind of, you know, do you teach, how do you teach someone to be a manager and kind of, you know, are you all going out as a manager with your staff members and kind of, you know, that mix of seniorities? But it's kind of, it's hard to see with such a small organisation had these problems that there isn't kind of um, issues elsewhere. I guess it's how you deal with it. Yeah, it's a process. If you, if you have a process to escalate it and it's zero tolerance, then over time that culture should should be getting better. So how can you change the culture in these companies? I guess that's what I'm what I'm saying. I mean, if there's not... You know, is it is it shining a light on these things? You know, these these um, these exposé by the FT by by Bloomberg about about these kind of shaming people. Is that going to have an impact? Maybe if there are more um, sort of advice or even requirements on like this it's sort of quite a boring word, but processes like you know, is there someone reporting to the board on HR? Is there someone on the board with HR? Do people you know remuneration is that something linked to to culture more there are whistleblowers i mean is there more of a sort of a financial incentive to get these things right but i i do think that this event will be causing a lot of changes that we're not aware of within corporates i mean even just sort of you know senior public relations advisors you ask them you know what are your clients saying and you know people are people are thinking about what's going on in their own organization do we have any skeletons you know how do we stop this happening in our organisation, I mean, I've spoken to um, two CEOs of, of other tr- trade bodies and they were saying, you know, well, we think our processes are really good. But actually, after this, we're going back through everything and making sure that there are no holes for this type of, you know, we don't want we don't want people in our organisation going to a newspaper with their problems. We want them coming inside, actually. We want them to know there's somewhere they can go. They're not going to get in trouble and they know we're going to fix it because ultimately that's the issue, isn't it? You know, if there's a problem... You want staff in your organisation to come to you and fix it and not feel they've got nowhere else to go other than going to the press because, you know, it can bring down an organisation, look what's happened. Does the chief executive automatically, and a lot of people would argue yes, have to know about these allegations at any time? Because it's a, it, at the end of the day, the buck stops with that person in charge. Yeah, I think they would probably feel a bit disappointed if they didn't know, but whether that message gets gets there, you know, it's sort of whether people feel empowered that they can go and raise something with a CEO. I don't know. It's a, it's a question the other people will definitely be asking. It's interesting, isn't it? The power of, of the scandal here, is, as you said, to prompt everyone to start looking for the, uh, the skeletons in the cupboard. So it does feel like perhaps this is a watershed moment for business in this country to really take a long, hard look at itself and to try to change. Do you feel like 
CEOs really are paying attention to this and looking at their own organisations and making sure that they are really fit for purpose. There's a huge amount of focus, not least because um, people like us probably ask them every time they go on an earnings call, every time there's an interview, they, they're getting asked about the CBI, they're getting asked about um, their opinion on it. There was a um, Business Connect event that um, Rishi Sunak and Jeremy Hunt um, held a few weeks ago to kind of bring CEOs together. And it was, you know, um, a question was asked of Rishi Sunak on stage by a CEO in the audience. Um, it's a bit of the elephant in the room, but we're meeting in the as you know horrible allegations swirl around the CPI. I'm not expecting you to comment on that, but I am personally worried that this might put women off joining industry, and I wondered if you're concerned about that, and if so, if the government's doing anything about it or might help in the future as the dust settles on this whole horrible scandal. Thank yeah. you. Uh, look, Helena, thank you for everything that that you've done. Uh, There's no way that people are not really focused on this even though it's quite a small organization that people outside the uk may not have heard of it really has had real ramifications across british business so Bart, thank you so much for joining us thank you thanks for listening to this week's in the city we'll be back next week but in the meantime if you like our show please head on over to apple podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts and rate review and subscribe. This episode was hosted by me, David Merritt. And me, Francine Lacqua. It was produced by Summer Sadi, Mohamed Farouk and Moses Andam. Additional editing by Blake Maples. And special thanks to Sabah Meddings. 